Welcome to Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. Life in Accounting is the podcast for everyday heroes like you, working in the accounting profession. Are you ready to hear from accounting influencers, thought leaders, visionaries, and other professionals leading change in the accounting world? Then stay tuned for Mark Goldman, a CPA, the owner of Where Accountants Go, and your host. Welcome to Life in Accounting. My hope is that that accountants don't shy away from technology, that they really embrace it and understand that it is, it is a key part of our job. Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Goldman, a CPA and your host for Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. That clip was from Steve Palomino, our guest for this week. Steve was suggested to us by a former guest, and his background is a little different than most of our recent guests. First of all, if you're a career changer and just getting into accounting, you'll definitely relate to Steve. He was actually a police officer before making the move into accounting. And then if you have an interest in technology or other consulting related areas, you're also going to find this beneficial because Steve made that transition himself from general ledger, you know, financial accounting related positions into technology related positions. And even then, for those in our audience that have had more project based careers or are considering that, you'll definitely get a lot out of this discussion about how to manage a project oriented career. Since Steve's been in the consulting space, much of his work has been project-based. There really is something in here for everybody. I truly enjoyed recording this podcast. If you find that this episode has been valuable to you, please make sure to subscribe to the show via iTunes or directly on our website, of course, at whereaccountantsgo.com. Once again, that's whereaccountantsgo.com. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Here's Steve Palomino from Dallas, Texas. Well, good morning, Steve. Thank you so much for making the time for this. I know you've been traveling quite a bit, so I really appreciate you working us into your schedule. Yeah, no problem. Glad to be here and glad to share my experiences around accounting and how I ended up where I'm at today. Perfect. Well, for the audience, Steve Palomino is on the line with us. And when he's not traveling, Steve's from Dallas and was actually referred to us by a former guest on our show, Donnie Shimamoto, which I'm sure you'll hear about that a little later in the story as Steve recounts his experiences. Steve, I've received a few requests from listeners for things such as, you know, guests with backgrounds in technology and other, you know, sort of consulting related areas, as well as a few requests for individuals coming from other backgrounds other than accounting where they've effectively changed careers and become accountants later in life. You fit both of those, so I'm really excited to be able to record this for the audience. Let's start at the beginning, though, so the audience gets you know a full story of where you came from, so to speak. How did you initially decide to even think about accounting as a possible career in the first place? Well, that's a great question. I get asked it quite a bit with different organizations that I like to spend time with in mentoring uh, younger folks. And I actually started in law enforcement when I was young. I started very young. They don't hire officers as young as they used to, probably a good thing. But I was uh, 19 when I entered the academy, and as long as you were out of the academy by 20, and I was a police officer. My parents did own a business, a retail business, and so I was always interested in numbers and the way my mom would balance the book and match transactions. And so uh, I always had an affinity or a like for numbers and matching, probably puzzles. And I went into law enforcement and spent 11 years there. Well, this was back in the late 80s. And as things change within organizations, they said, hey, you need to get a degree, a four-year degree, in order to promote to leadership. I thought, okay, great. So I asked my uh, sergeant what he thought I should get a degree, and he said, I don't know. Go talk to your dad. And so I went and asked my dad, and he said, I don't know, get a degree in something you can get a job in. So back then, as many of your listeners probably don't realize now, there was no LinkedIn, and there was no Monster or anything like that. There was the one ad. And so I went through the one ads and started at A, and several pages in a fine print, went to B, which was bookkeeping. So accounting were the first several pages and bookkeeping was the next few. So I said, oh, well, get my accounting degree. 
which is what I happened to do and was able to go to Arizona State University went full time and work full time, which is a bit of a challenge as a policeman, but I worked night and had my accounting degree and started working. Uh, once I received that degree in the department found out that I was doing working in that sort of field, they started, I started working with some of the money laundering and some of the, the drug interdiction that was going on back then and spent time working with organized crime groups and the gang squads and so on and so forth and really had a great time, but I got hurt and that leads to the transition. And so after I was injured, the department said, hey, you can decide to do something, but it can't be a cop. And so I ended up retiring from the department at a fairly young age and needed a job. And so luckily, I did have my accounting degree and I transitioned into working for a staff accountant. And I always get the question from individuals, how did you make that transition or was it hard? And my response is, it actually is, they're very similar jobs. Most accounting work or accounting type work is very rule-based, very fact-based, and it tends to be fairly emotional. I probably just described the majority of, of it that you'll talk to. And so I also, after a while, realized why the FBI and, and Oregon's federal organization tend to like to hire CPAs or accountants, individuals with accounting degrees, because it's very rule-based. So that's kind of a long story to how I uh, went from law enforcement into accounting and it's been a good thing. I really am fortunate that I got my accounting degree. How long were you an officer? I spent 11 years on the department. Oh, wow. Okay. But I was, I had started very young. And so when I came out of the department, I probably would have been maybe three or four years senior to what maybe someone would have, you know, come out of their undergrad and then gone into, you know, into public accounting. Back then, that was the, the main objective for most people at, at ASU in the business school of accounting. It was, you know, to land at one of the, I believe it was the big eight back then. Uh, <laughs> <Your> <laughs> a day bit of a change. Up, but that's okay. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm not that old, I promise. It, uh, it went I, quick. I can't tell you how many people we've had on the show that basically chose accounting because someone told them or they realized that they could get a job if they had an accounting degree. That it was just that simple. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, being employed was a, you know, it's, it was a big deal. You know, obviously we need to, and it really is a great career. I can't say enough about accounting. And really when I came out and hit the environment as an accountant, it was the industry or the profession in essence was going through a massive transformation. The transformation was going from paper based into, into really computer environments, computer systems. It was the beginning of, you know, Windows 3.1, Excel was finally stable. And so we had these, you know, these new opportunities that were on the horizon for, for those with accounting degrees. Interesting. Yeah, let's talk about those early years because I'm curious, I guess, what your first few jobs in accounting were and then also how you transitioned from, you know, traditional, you know, general ledger, you know, type of accounting roles into the business process and, you know, performance improvement areas. What were those early years like? Well, I... I feel that the genesis for my future really was is at the beginning. I started with a cargo company. They were very friendly to vets and law enforcement. And so they took pity upon me and, and gave me a job as a staff accountant. My resume didn't uh, read very strong for accounting, as you can imagine, right? There's not a, a lot of crossover skill sets on that one resume to the other. And so I started working as a staff accountant doing probably what most accountants still do today, although most of it was on paper, which was booking journal entries after we looked at variances and accounts. And what I found early on, I've always been adept to computer systems. I, there, obviously, there weren't a lot back then, but I did enjoy playing with them. I did program in, you know, Arizona State, they required you to take a, back then it was a DOS class and some other programming type of courses. And so once I started into that, into those skill sets, I was able to leverage it. So when I started at the, the cargo company, I realized that uh, quite a bit of the work that they were doing was very manual and using Microsoft Access. I believe it was 3.1 or maybe 4.0. I was able to perform a lot more tasks a lot quicker. And so that was kind of enlightened me to changing the process. And I really didn't get much resistance from the organization as far as doing it differently. They're like, oh, we don't care. You know, can you can do it faster and do more? And it's more accurate. Great. Knock yourself out. And so that I think that's really how the foundation for you know what I do today, where it started, and kind of the epiphany that if I really understood technology, that I would have a leg up on other accountants probably, and that I would have a probably a broader future. 
Okay. So just to, to clarify, so they were doing a lot of things on access and you moved them out of that to something else that was more effective? No, no, they were paper. It, it was paper oh. and Excel. In okay. AS400, you would run the, the tape, the old day, those on the phone. Again, they probably don't know what it is, but it was a, they'd give you a 10 key and a ruler and a lot of paper and you would run a tape and in foot by hand, right? And once you would foot your paperwork, you would then type it into a big mainframe computer, usually a clerk had to do that work. Then you would print it and have your boss run a tape physically, and then you would take it back to the clerk and confirm it, put it in a file, a physical file, and stick it in those metal bins that you see probably in some of the older movies. And that's how we did the work. I was able to take that process, pack the data from AS400, and drop it into Microsoft Access database and produce reports. And then I was able to then start leveraging electronic file share back in the old day, right? We just had shared files and uh, start to drive our uh, processes forward using technology instead of just physical paper. Okay. Okay. I, I know you're doing more consulting now, I guess. Take us through those years between Carver and and what you're doing now, sort of the high point. How did your career progress? Well, I was very fortunate. I lived in San Francisco and my cousin worked for what was then Pacific Bell. And he called me and said, hey, we've got this really huge hiring uh, initiative. Would you be interested in applying for a job? I did. And I ended up at Pacific Bell, which was really cool. I ended up working with large databases. Of course, even back then, PacBell had you know, maybe 8 million customers or 10 at the time. So you can imagine the bill rounds, plus there was the long distance work. So there's quite a bit of work there. And I worked as a staff accountant and it really moved into a whole different level of, you know, uh, data transformation and process improvement. And I ultimately ended up uh, working in the CFO suite, the C-suite, where I helped support once they merged and became SBC. Now, of course, they're AT&T and worked in the C-suite, supported the 10K and Q reporting activities. And from there, of course, made a lot of connections and met a lot of individuals and actually, by happenstance, met the Anderson folks. Of course, Anderson's no longer with us, but got really interested in consulting because back then, Pacific Bell used to to hire quite a few consultants. And so I started to see what these guys were doing. It seemed like a great job, a lot of fun, and it was very dynamic. Plus, you got to work at a number of different organizations. And I think I had a real desire, and I don't think I did have a real desire to experience corporations, experience, you know, what's the difference between this company and the next 10 or what's the difference between a telecom company and a retail company. So that's when I really started driving towards moving into the consulting world. Okay. Did you go to work with Anderson? I almost did. <laughs> oh, okay. But Enron hit before I actually ended up there. So I ended up at two of the big fours doing IT audit support and audit and also a performance improvement in their advisory. So I did make it to both Ernst & Young and PAC, and I worked at Hitachi Consulting, which focuses more. Back then, they used to focus more on ERP implementations and IT, finance IT type applications and performance improvement efforts and activities. Okay. Okay. And what is your role now exactly? I understood from talking to you and Donnie a little bit that somehow y'all work together, but I, I really don't know all the details here. What sure, do you sure. Donnie and I have known each other for a number of years. Actually, when I was at PwC, they wanted me to do a post-implementation audit certification. I went and looked through all the documentation and looked at you know collegiate type of journals, right, and was not really able to find anything on, well, how... Well, what should an auditor do to certify that, for instance, HFM or some sort of a system consolidation system like that, what should we have to do? What boxes would we check? And couldn't find anything. Finally called the ICPA and they said, oh, we, there's this guy named Donnie Shimamoto who heads up this ITEC organization or ITEC group or ITMA, I believe is what it's called today. And they're really focused on accounting and technology. So that's how Donnie and I got together and started working on building out processes and documentation and collateral for the AICPA to really help accountants bridge that gap between technology and accounting. Okay. Well, that was a long time ago, right? Ten years? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. at least 10 years. It oh, goes wow. quick. And in the meantime, Donnie and I obviously worked at different places and recently I decided, gosh, I'd really like to go out on my own. And I spent two years working for a software robotics company, which was really, really fascinating to spend time with the hard technology side of the business, 
where they're looking at developing software robotics for accounting and finance activities, mostly bookkeeping type effort. And once I moved on from that position, I decided that I would go out on my own. And Donnie said, hey, come partner with me. And here I am working with Donnie. Hmm. When did you make that decision to go out on your own? Well, about three years ago. But actually, (laughs) it's one of those things where you have to most certainly plan for it. And the stars aligned in October of last year. And that's when I decided to make the plunge. Give it a shot. My situation was similar. I made the decision a long time before, but then there was the planning, and then there was I had to convince my wife. You know, <laughs> this wasn't going to be. Well, okay it, it, it's it's funny you mention that. That's exactly who I had to convince, and she came up with a, my business plan and said, "You have so much time to make so much money, or go back to one of the big four. So <laughs> you have a yes. built-in accountability partner. That's oh, I do. That's for sure. <laughs> so it seems like your more recent career since the big eight time, so maybe more than 10 years, but it seems like more of it has been sort of project oriented. What have you enjoyed about working more on projects? And I guess what are some of the advantages that you've seen? What I really love about project work is you get to see something beginning to end. And you just reminded me, actually, one of the frustrations that I had working at AT AT&T, I'll just use AT&T loosely, it's really SBC who became AT&T. Some AT&Ters may argue that, but one of the challenges that I felt was that you never really got a witness anything in. So I was part of the NCR Teradata build-out team. I did some really, really fun things, you know, helped pioneer implementation of HFM and S-Base and a number of different applications out there. Just did some great stuff, but it never seemed like you could see the end of it. There was never a beginning and an end. And what I really enjoy with project work, like right now I'm out at, at a retail company and we're implementing black line matching, part of one of many tools. But the fun part is I actually get to work with the team, look at their processes, suggest some better ways to do it, and actually take them through implementation, you know, design, identification, design, build, and ultimately handing it over and you know, sort of like Frankenstein, watching it live. And I really enjoy that. I also enjoy the diversity of individuals you meet. So you get to meet people from all kinds of different backgrounds and histories and life experiences. So I really just enjoy the variation that comes with project work. Okay. If I'm a a younger professional, not entry level though, you know, maybe I'm five to 10 years in my career and I'm looking at getting into the project arena, whether maybe it's working with you know, multiple companies one after another, or maybe it's just a, a project oriented, you know, position with one organization. What should I be aware of? What are some of the, I don't want to say disadvantages, but, you know, just items to watch out for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, if you do, so I think you have a great question there. So working for very large companies like the AT&Ts or the Walmarts is an accountant, is a staff accountant, as you move up in the ladder of leadership you tend to be fairly secure, which is nice. With monotony comes security, I guess. And so you end up in a situation where you don't have to constantly be looking down the horizon for your next project. Project work can be a bit more challenging as if you land in an organization that maybe picks the wrong technology and that technology starts to wane perhaps, or if you fall into an organization or part of an organization that does consulting or advisory work. And let's say that portion of the that stack, let's say, is starting to die or dry up, right? Uh, then you can find yourself having to quickly, you know, you're constantly looking for another place to be, if that makes sense. So that would be the, you know, it's a bit more of a challenge, right? You're more in charge of your own destiny, I guess. That, so it's a double-edged sword. It's nice because you have a whole lot more uh, independence, even in the larger organizations, right? Whereas if you focus on one position, then you're driven by, for instance, the closed calendar. I closed the books at SBC 60 times. By about 58 times, you're like, gosh, this is just not as fun as it used to be. So that's really some of the pitfalls on both sides. Okay. Any advice for what to do to help manage some of that uncertainty? Any things you've done that worked well or things you've done that didn't work well, and so don't do that? (laughs) Yeah, I I think as we start to think about uncertainty, I always tease people, you know, when I work as a consultant, usually your identification is, you know, contingent worker or something like that. They know you're not an employee. And I always tease everyone and say, we're all contingent workers. You know, mostly as you're coming into the business, you know, world or you're in midstream and, and changing careers, obviously you felt the impact of change. 
and that's why you're looking to a new career. That's the bottom line is, you know, ensure that you have the deepest skills that you possibly can have, wide and deep as you possibly can get within an area that you like. So if you're into retail, you know, understand the supply chain, understand operations, understand how the business works, and it makes you more a more effective accountant. If you're looking to go into internal audit, let's say, again, same advice, try to really understand the business so that you become a value-add member of the team. And that seems to be, you know, a really uh, good way to stay in the positions that you enjoy. Okay. We all have to take positions we don't like, right, mostly when it comes to consulting work, but you can most certainly direct yourself into the buckets that where you really are successful. Okay. With your situation now, is it structured where you're pretty much you know, 100% dedicated to one project at a time, or are you managing multiple projects? Usually it's managing multiple projects, and when you okay. look at the advisory world or the consulting world, it definitely is. It's like, I hate to use the word pyramid, but it's a good way to describe it. Ideally, as you build out your firm, you want to have multiple projects underneath you and multiple resources working on those projects. I tend to spend more of my time now in my later career really on pre-sales type work, looking at the situation, assessing it, understanding whether or not, you know, are we really a good fit for you? Can we provide you the resources that you need? Or, you know, hey, give one of my other friends a call and I'd be able to help you out. Okay. Well, as of the time we're recording this, the episode hasn't come out. But by the time this episode is released, Donnie's episode will be out. So people will know that Donnie spends about half his time in Hawaii. Is he making you go to Hawaii also? Is, is that yeah, he forced on? me to go uh, a couple of times. <laughs> I just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was just there actually last week, and it was quite beautiful, mostly coming from Dallas, which has been freezing, and I've been up here working in Seattle, and it's, it's also been fairly unusually brisk, so it was it was nice to get out there in the sun. <laughs> now, I, I'm just curious, since your wife is your accountability partner, apparently, in the business as well, are, are you requiring that she comes out to Hawaii with you, or is that one of her requirements? Uh, yes, it is. Actually, unfortunately, she couldn't rearrange her schedule. My wife's an attorney, and... She wasn't able to uh, clear her calendar, so I had to go by myself. Ah, darn. <laughs> <laughs> so there might have been some golfing in there, but, but we don't know. But we don't know. Right? No one took pictures. So we just That's know. right. <laughs> well, what's your vision or your hope for the future of what you're doing now? You know, if, you, if you look down the road three, five years, you know, what does success look like for you guys? Success for us most certainly is growth. Our hope is to definitely grow our organization and to continue to, you know, drag accounting individuals and, and our profession kicking and screaming into the, the mid 2000s. Now, that's another thing I always tease accountants with. You know, technology is, and, and that's why I've been so involved with robotics. I've written, been interviewed by several periodicals and written a number of articles that you can find on the internet. Angle me. But what I find fascinating and my hope is that accountants don't shy away from technology, that they really embrace it and understand that it is a key part of, of our jobs. You know, we don't use paper. The majority of our work, even at small firms or small businesses, is all virtual. And my hope is that over the next three to five years that we can, one, bring technology down into the mid-market. The lower in the mid-market have been, I don't want to say ignored but they really kind of have been with technology, which means that organizations that are out there, these smaller shops that maybe have a CFO and five accountants, they say to themselves, oh gosh, technology, it's too expensive or it's too big or I can't use it or it's not going to affect me. And all those things are not true. And so the next three to five years, what I'm really hoping to see occur and which I believe will occur is that these technologies that always lived at the bigger end, process improvements are going to come down which is going to make our economy even more efficient and, I, I believe, make companies more profitable. So that's what I hope I can – my legacy will be that, you know, hey, this guy came in and he helped me leverage technology where I didn't think I could use it. He helped me improve my processes where I didn't think I could. And in the end, I was able to have a stronger business and hopefully a better life. I would assume that's your sweet spot, too, the mid-market just given the size of the consulting firm. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely, I've, in my past, I spent more of my time in the, the larger organizations, mm -hmm. but I've always enjoyed working with the mid-market companies because it's sort of that end-to-end, -end, Phil, we discussed. You're able to affect more change, and you're able to 
I believe, uh, reap more benefits of what we have to offer because the decision makers are actually able to make decisions that affect the whole organization versus just perhaps their silo or their stack. Well, I want to get down to the final questions, but before we do, one last question. A listener suggested this one in the early days, and I just love it. If you could go back in time and give your younger self just one piece of advice, what might that be? You know, I was thinking about that question on the way over, and I'd have to say I would tell myself to listen more carefully to what others have to say. You want to expand on that? Is there an interesting story well, behind that? Uh, <laughs> you know, I just, it's funny. My wife always tells me I don't listen. You know, I think as accountants or working in law enforcement, you're listening to solve problems. That's what you're there for. So if you come in as an auditor, you know, you're listening to check a box. You're listening to put that information inside of a process that you are there to complete, right? Confirming that, you know, all the cans of corn really exist, right? Or all the gallons of wine at the winery really exist, right? Versus going out there and listening to the organization and trying to understand, well, what, you know, what are they trying to accomplish? Why do they even want me here? I know maybe in some cases I'm a necessary evil if I'm an auditor, like the policeman, but what's the purpose and what, by listening very carefully, can I offer better solutions? Can I better understand their issues and perhaps, again, add greater value to my presence there with them? That's a good point. A lot of times we listen really just to confirm what we think the answer is in the first place. Like you said, check a box. And that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and it's hard to. I mean, honestly, try it today. Try listening, really listening without making a, drawing a conclusion. It's, it's quite the challenge. Well, I have a meeting after this. I'm going to do that. <laughs> okay, awesome. <laughs> Well, let's get down to the final questions because I want to be respectful of your time and, and I want to make sure we have you know a good amount of time for these questions. First one I always ask, and usually the easiest, what has been your proudest moment? Gosh, I've had many. Graduating the police academy was probably one of my proudest moments. You know, my whole family was there before my father had passed away. So that was a really proud moment. But I also have to say that when I was working at PwC, I grew up in a, you know, a not so great area. My parents didn't go to college. They were born. I was very young and they were very old back when it was not usual to have that. And so my parents, my dad went to third grade, my mom to the sixth. They were very successful, but obviously worked very hard to get there. And when I started working at PwC uh, as a CPA, we were in New York City at their big headquarters at doing some consulting work for a large telecom that's based out east. And I was sitting in their boardroom with a bunch of the, the PwC executives, and I looked out the window at the Manhattan skyline, and I thought, wow, how amazing that, you know, being an accountant and being a CPA brought me from this little place called Glendale, Arizona, all the way to the very top of the accounting heap looking across the Manhattan skyline. So that, that's something that's always stuck in my mind, and I've always been appreciative of folks at PwC for giving me that chance. Manhattan really is a, a neat place. I got the opportunity to go from being a CPA as well. I, some of my volunteer activities ended up landing me in a meeting at the AICPA offices. And yeah, it's just, if you haven't been to Manhattan, it's an experience. <laughs> it really is. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so it's a place I never thought I would have ever been. So in, you know, leaving ASU when I did, when it was the Big Eight, I didn't have much of a chance of landing in one of those places, obviously, because I was a policeman. Mm-hmm and had a different career path. So it was a pretty proud moment, I have to say. Well, I'm going to preface this next question. You know, it doesn't have to be just in your accounting life, but in your overall life. If it's in accounting, that's fine. But if not, that's fine too. Tell us about a mistake you've made and what you learned from it, of course, because that's where the gold is. But frankly, the bigger, the better. Gosh, mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> the fun one. Which one? All over. Jeez. Uh, Biggest mistake. I think, okay, I'll give one for your listeners. The biggest mistake I ever made in my career was moving positions for salary. Hmm. I didn't feel comfortable with the move. I wasn't sure about the company, but they were so insistent on me joining the firm, joining the organization. It It was a corporation. They offered me an amazing amount of money and I went and it was and now I know why they had to offer people because, because it was awful. <laughs> and so that would be, I think, out of all the mistakes I've made, and of course we all make plenty, that's it. Don't move for money. Make sure that you're moving for 
you know, career advancement or, you know, growing out your toolkit, those kinds of things. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. That is good for all of us to hear. I think many of us make that mistake. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then you're like, why did I do this, you know? <laughs> well, last question, and then we'll go ahead and close it down. What is the best piece of advice that you ever received? Best piece of advice that I ever received was enjoy every single day and enjoy what you're doing every single day, whether it's mopping a floor, cleaning a toilet, or clearing out a spreadsheet. Yeah, really just try to enjoy it. Make sure that you enjoy those moments because they won't always be there for you. That is a good point. A lot of times we get wrapped up, particularly as accountants, in the long-term planning and even in our own career. And yeah, stop and smell the roses, right? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Well, Steve, thank you so much for sharing with us. As with many episodes, I have a general idea of where we're going to go, but there's always some nice surprises. And definitely, we've gotten some good insight from you. So I really appreciate you taking the time for us. Sure. My pleasure. And glad to share my story. And hopefully it helps someone in transition or it helps someone decide what direction they're going to go into or not go. (laughs) Wonderful. Well, for our audience, this has been another episode of Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. If you haven't yet visited the home website, please do so. You can find us online at whereaccountantsgo.com. Once again, that's www.whereaccountantsgo.com. On that note, Steve, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave the audience with? No, I appreciate you doing this, and thank you for collecting our stories. Maybe 100 years from now, people will know how we lived as accountants and what we did in our daily lives. Wonderful. I hadn't thought of it that way. But thank you. I enjoy it. Well, thank you to the audience again for joining us. We will see everyone next week. There's more to come.